afraid that's all the time we have. So. <laughs> Um, thank you for showing up. This is a very cool maker fair, isn't it? Yeah. You know, this is all the creation of my buddy Mark Mathias. This like one guy like made this. Now and it's what third year. Um, anyway, so yeah, so most people associate me, associate me as the tech columnist of the New York Times, but um, I left in October to start a brand new website that we opened in January called Yahoo Tech, which yesterday had its first three million visitor day. Um, this, is, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's this beautiful tiled thing. There's no banner ads, no display ads. And what's really cool is when you click on one of these article tiles, it expands in place. It doesn't open a new tab or a new window. It just goes like that. You have to make the noise with your mouth yourself. But, um, and then you scroll down and there's the next row of articles. You've never left the page you're on. So there's no navigation to worry about, and um, everything is clickable, so if I want to read the, uh, the columnists, we have five tech columnists from New York Times, Washington Post, Family Circle, another New York Times, another New York Times, there's all the columns, uh, click one, let's see, I heard this guy's pretty good, um, and you can click my name to see all my articles and videos, uh, it's very cool and I think you should check it out, the, the, the difference between this and all other technology sites, um, I feel like the world is well covered with the, and, and gadgets and gizmodos and verges on techie stuff, on uh, the bus speeds and which uh, CFO is leaving Microsoft and, and that stuff. I feel like most people really don't care. So our mission is what to buy and how to use it once you've got it. That's all we do. And um, so far I think we're, we're resonating. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about I, I found that picture on Flickr, thinking that it would convey impact and change, and now I see it, it just looks like the cover of Dianetics. <laughs> <laughs> kind of change that, but um, I, I feel like things are changing so fast in technology and therefore in culture, so I thought I'd give you a quick fly-through of uh, some of the things that are changing. It, it all started a few years ago when this thing came out. They call it iPhone or Android phone, and I have a problem with that term. It's, it's the last thing it is, is a phone. Ask anyone under 20. How often they use it to make phone calls? They don't. Uh, last survey, the average person uses this thing 12% of the time for phone calls. Only 12% of the time. Everything else exploits things like these ingredients that are inside. So you've got a touch screen, you've got input and output for audio and video. You've got all these sensors, a tilt sensor, proximity sensor, so it turns off the screen when it's against your head. Um, it, it has a, a, a GPS, a gyroscope, a compass, it knows which way you're facing. And so what people do is they write apps that take, <laughs> take advantage of these things. There's now a million, one million apps for uh, the iPhone and another million for Android. And um, I'm glad we have the whole day because I'm going to be covering all of them. <laughs> now, I'm, I just want to cover one of them. It's a, it's a few years old, but it's a great case in point. So an ocarina is actually a South American wind instrument. It's like a play flute. So this music teacher in California writes this $1 app called Ocarina, which emulates the musical instrument. So you, you finger these holes, and you blow into the microphone. So this is the one song I know. <laughs> so you tip it when you want vibrato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your kids sit in the back of the car on long rides, rotting their brains on video games. Mine are back there practicing their music. <laughs> So what's really cool is he, he became a mega hit, sold a million and a half copies in six months. The guy became a millionaire overnight. What are you doing here? Get going! <laughs> um, and, um, and so what's cool is you can tap this button down here and there's a, a Google Earth sort of view where it tunes in to one of those millions of people around the world who have this app and are playing it and you listen in. Okay, this is Europe. Beethoven! Of course, they're European. <laughs> okay, we hit next, we spin around the world. Uh, an American, 
Looks like Texas. Yeah, you're terrible. <laughs> keep at it. You know. Now, what I want to do, I want to keep going until we get to uh, Tokyo. You get these like three-year-olds doing Flight of the Bumblebee. It's like <laughs> this is. Is this even working? This is doing nothing, is it? It's working. It is. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's Turkey. <laughs> I think if everybody had this app, there would be no more wars. <laughs> like, Ahmed can't play the F sharp either. We're all brothers. You know? um, so it became a huge hit. There's 3,500 pieces of operative sheet music online. There are uh, YouTube videos of people playing. This is uh, five college kids doing Stairway to Heaven. As it points out. I have no idea what this is like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I said that this guy is a, um, a music teacher in California. OK, he's a professor of computer music at Stanford. That's a music teacher. Um, anyway, so what does he do for an encore? He writes another app called uh, I Am T-Pain. T-Pain is a rapper who became famous by auto-tuning himself on everything. You know what auto-tune is? It's the music processing effect that fixes you when you're a little sharp or a little flat, especially if you're Britney or Taylor. Um, so, so he wrote an app that auto-tunes you. You sing into your phone and you listen to yourself through the earbuds. And um, so this guy, T-Pain, went on Jimmy Kimmel Live and did this skit that I'm about to show you where he auto-tunes the president, who wasn't even singing. Health plan do for America? It provides health insurance to people who don't have it. Well, that sounds good, Mr. President, but I tell you what, it could sound a whole lot better. Hey, Amen. Amazingly, we've got 80% agreement. We got 80% agreement. <laughs> There's 27 million Americans who don't have any health insurance at all. No health insurance at all. <laughs> I'm not the first president to take up this cause, but I am determined to be the last. Determined to be the last. Patients, patients, hospitals, hospitals, wasting money, money, healthcare, 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 pharmaceutical industry, pharmaceutical industry, diabetes, diabetes, food amputation, amputation. God bless you, and may God bless the hospitals. <laughs> Never let it be said that technology doesn't have a cultural impact. <laughs> um, so the um, uh, the cool thing is that the, these phones have in them uh, a permanent internet connection. It has a camera. It knows which way you're facing. It knows how you're tilting the phone. So the next wave is what I'm really excited about. It's augmented reality. And that is you look through the phone and it overlays text labels for what you're seeing. Here's a little, a little medley of some examples. Um, this one is uh, for the London subway system. You look down through the ground, and it shows you what subways are under your feet. And then you raise it 90 degrees, and it shows you which way to walk to get to those stations. There's one for the New York sub subway, too. It's called the nearest subway. Um, it works exactly like this. So cool. This next one is called Twitter Round. You point it at a building, and it shows you who's on Twitter right now. <laughs> and you tap the icon, it shows you what they're saying. Oh, <laughs> Most of the time, yeah, it's, like, there's some pervert out the window with a phone! <laughs> um, this is an experimental app. Uh, it uses facial recognition to show you who it is and what his social media contacts are. I mean, how useful, that would be so useful at a party, you know? Oh, hi! Bob! <laughs> so, you know, I hear people say, you know, oh my gosh, technology is so advanced, these phones are so thin, so beautiful. I've been in this business long enough to know this is not thin and beautiful. Okay, this is the Commodore 64 right here. <laughs> this is so primitive. You're going to tell your grandchildren, you know, when I was your age, the phones were an eighth of an inch thick. <laughs> you couldn't roll them up back then. You know, so 
these these are this next augmented reality app is so far fetched and impossible looking. You'll think it's a fake. I did when someone sent me this. I literally wrote back, "Ha ha, very funny." But it is a real app. You can buy it right now for five bucks. It's called Word Lens, and basically, you point it at anything written in Spanish. That's right. It shows you the translation in the video. Same font, same background. I mean, how the heck do they do that? That's, that is totally amazing. Sometimes it's really useful information, too. Uh, recent attack of shark. That's, that's very handy. Useful for menus. <laughs> Soft, spicy of anchovies. Uh, sometimes really important information. <laughs> Clothes optional in this beach. And then you can go in there and switch the direction, or you can switch to French, Italian, or German. And it will translate everything it sees, and it really works. There's no telling where we can go with augmented reality. All I know is we're just at the beginning of it. This next one is an example I made up, but you trust me, we'll get there. This is the swine flu app. <laughs> My son is such a good sport. You let me infect him for that video. <laughs> Just well. um, so you, you hear a lot about the Internet of Things, which is this weird, weird grammatical term I can't stand. I don't know why they call it that. Um, it just means things that get online, right? Objects that get online. People, um, I mean, if you think about what you've got here, this is a complete computer, right? Processor, memory, storage, internet, camera, screen, audio, speakers. So it is, in effect, the brain that can be attached to all kinds of other gadgets. So why recreate the wheel? So people use it to control their home entertainment systems as a remote control. Um, there is this, uh, this thing called the Izon. It's a tiny home security video camera. It doesn't have any memory or storage or wireless because, uh, uh, because, uh, or screen because you have that on your phone. So you can peek in on your house from wherever you happen to be in the world. Although I love, I love their ad here. They've got the young mom at work keeping an eye on her newborn baby at home. <laughs> Someone think this through, like, oh, she's got her head between the bars again. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do about it? Um, this is remote PC. It lets you see and control your Mac or your PC back at home from the screen of your phone. So you can click and double click and open the apps, run apps. This one I love. This is the Nest thermostat, the world's first internet connected thermostat. Uh, I have two of them at home. Um, so. I have an upstairs and downstairs. There's uh, usually nobody at home but my kids these days. Uh, 72, typical. That's totally unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> they can put on a damn sweater. <laughs> <laughs> so I just changed the temperature of my house from here. Um, and it, it, they, they discovered that half of all people who buy programmable thermostats never program them. They don't know how, it's too hard. So this thing has infrared eyes that monitors your behavior when you leave the house, when you come home, and it sets the thermostat automatically according to your patterns. You may have read that Google bought this company last month for $3.2 billion. Um, you know, you know, I guess it wasn't enough but they can already monitor our email and our phone calls and our websites. Now they can know when we're home. Um, a lot, I, I've spoken a lot recently about Web 2.0. This is the idea that, um, well here, this is Web 1.0. This is a website where the owner of the website puts up the words in the pictures, okay? In Web 2.0, the visitors to your site provide all the material. So Facebook is the classic example. If you took away everything that she put there, that's all you'd have. Right, so it's just a template. Very popular concept. As you may know, Facebook uh, has 1.3 billion members. That is one-sixth of the Earth's population with their private data in the hands of this guy. 
a very, uh, very profound idea. This is the idea behind Craigslist. Free classified ads in every city, help wanted, for sale, personals. Um, extremely powerful idea. I just sold couches through Craigslist yesterday. Um, the uh, Wikipedia, I mean, whoever thought this would fly? An encyclopedia where any idiot can write anything. <laughs> and yet, it works. It's been shown to be just as accurate as the Encyclopedia Britannica, which, as you may have read, ceased publication last year. There is no more printed encyclopedia. This is what it is. Um, I, I love the, uh, the joke columns in Reader's Digest. Um, there's one column where, uh, where working people send in funny stories from their working lives. And this one was sent in by a college librarian. She reported that on the first day of classes, a freshman walks in the library and says, Whoa, what are all those matching books? <laughs> and she said, Well, so nasty encyclopedia. And he goes, Dude, somebody actually printed out the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, we, we crossed the line somewhere. Um, but a lot of sites use this idea of person-to-person of -person putting stuff up. So Flickr, where you put your pictures for all to see. YouTube, where you put your videos for all to see. I hope you're, you're tracking this. These two guys invented YouTube and then sold it to Google, again Google, one year later for $1.7 billion, <laughs> a year later. They, so I, they were on a, a video on YouTube after the sale, I, I watched it, I thought I would you know, hear them make intelligent comments about the blossoming Web 2.0 universe. It wasn't, it was these two guys going, woohoo, $1.7 billion, yeah! <laughs> Should. Um, this is my favorite Web 2.0 example. Who is sick dot org? Um, my kids come home from Staples with the nastiest bugs, right? And you know we don't know if we're supposed to, if we can take them on spring break or whatever. So you know you call the doctor and the doctor says, oh yeah, that's going around. I had 30 of that in my office yesterday. She'll be fine by tomorrow. You know, so if you'd known that, it would have been useful. So here you click off your symptoms. Um, you know, bloody stool, poor vision, fatty skin. <laughs> And then it collates all that information, and you sit back and watch the bugs drift over your neighborhood. <laughs> like, how awesome is that? So, the Web 2.0 has been around for a couple of years. What's new this year, um, it doesn't really have a good name. I'm calling it World 2.0. So this is where things get interesting. If you think about all the brands in the world, all the companies, really, they're just, they're just a bunch of people. They're just a bunch of us going to work. Right? And for, since the beginning of capitalism, the way things have worked is when we want to buy something or transact something, we go to the brand. That's just the way most people do it. But what's happened now is this Web 2.0 idea of connecting people, strangers, with very similar mutual interests has entered the real world. And the more and more, we are now going directly to each other using the internet as nothing more than uh, a facilitator that connects us together. So, so it started a few years ago with eBay, right, where you could buy and sell junk in your attic to other people directly without any store involved, and, and Amazon's used books work the same way, right? Amazon is just, Amazon never sees the book. You're just buying a used book directly from someone else in America who's selling it really cheaply. But now, the, I mean, the thing about those things is they were still anonymous. You still never knew this person or saw her. So now what's happening is we are bringing Web 2.0 into the physical world where we meet these people. We're entering their lives and their cars and their homes. This is Airbnb. Next time you go to a city, you should consider this. Instead of staying at a hotel, you look over, like if I'm going to San Francisco, you look over people's homes that they're willing to rent you for really cheap. So here's me, let's, this is, I'm going for a week, so $750, I look through pictures of the guy's apartment, read about the views, the amenities, he's got a washer dryer, you wouldn't get that in a hotel, read about him, see ratings of people who stayed there before, how was it, did the radiator sweep, um, and then you book it and you stay there, they are on track to sell 100 million nights of lodging in five years from now, that is more than hotels rent out. Um, so it's totally amazing. Um, all these sites, by the way, were born between 2008 and 2010. 
Can anyone guess why? Because of the crash, because the financial crash, everybody needed money. So people with their apartment to rent, they needed money. And people who were going to stay there didn't want to pay hotel prices, they needed money. So everybody wins, except the hotels. But um, TaskRabbit is another cool example. This is you listing grunt work that you want done. Take me to the airport or clean my gutters or whatever it is. And people bid to see who will do it for the least money. Like ordinary people. So my wife's, my, my wife was in San Francisco and she had a big presentation and she was sick and she was bumming out because she, she didn't have any vitamin C or echinacea, which she believes cures colds. Um, and, uh, and so I, being the dutiful husband, thought, you know, I can do something about this. So I went to TaskRabbit and I said, I need somebody in San Francisco to go to Walgreens, buy echinacea and vitamin C and deliver it to this office address had a taker in 15 minutes. There was a $30 offer, a $25, and a $20 offer. Wow. I took the $20 offer. Guy did that, delivered it to her office in 20 minutes. And my wife thinks I'm some kind of god. <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> Completely awesome. Um, but this is really going to blow your mind. This is cutting edge up to the minute. This just came to Westport yesterday. <laughs> So Uber is now in 100 cities. Uber started out as a black car service, you know, car service. You need a ride somewhere. If, has anyone taken a ride in one of the Westport taxis? They're like Beirut on wheels. Like stinky and falling apart, and the driver smells, and he doesn't speak English. Anyway, so this is, you open the app. You don't do anything but one tap, one tap, and you see where all the car service cars are near you, in 10 seconds, you get a message that says, okay, the closest one is come and get you. Here's the guy's name, here's his rating, here's when he'll be there. You can call him, you can look him up, you see his picture, he picks you up, takes you where you want to go. You don't have to pay him or tip him because the credit card is already on file, it's all automatic, it takes all the tension out of this thing and then you rate him when you get out of the car, um, and there's the price. Okay, so that's very cool, that's revolutionizing everything, that's very disruptive. But, that's not World 2.0. This is where things get really cool. Until now, they've had two services, the black cars and the SUVs for more money. Well, a few months ago, they just unrolled Uber X, which is even cheaper, and this is not a black car or an SUV, this is an ordinary person in his car! <laughs> These are normal people like us with some time between appointments and want to make a few extra bucks. So I did this. The other day I was in San Francisco. I had to get to the airport. So I took a gamble on it. I hit Uber X. It said, Heather is coming to get you in her Honda CRV. This is so weird. <laughs> and she pulled up right in front of me. She was a soccer mom. She said, like, hi, how you doing? Want a bottle of water? <laughs> sure. Oh, you got an iPhone. Want a charging cord? No taxi driver ever said that to me. <laughs> and she didn't you know, smell bad. And she didn't yammer her phone the whole way. She's like, just driving me to the airport. I'm like, this is wild, huh? She goes, oh, it's very wild. <laughs> it was the coolest thing ever. And what's neat is both you and the other guy are both excited to be there. It's cool. It's kind of neat. Um, and so it's not just, you know, some guy in the front seat who hates his job and hates his life. It's, it's both people having fun. It is joyous. It was a third the price of a taxi. And I said to her, how do you know I'm not a serial killer? How do you know you're not going to wind up in a gutter somewhere? And she goes, oh, because when you get out, I rate you. So the system knows how good the drivers are and the passengers are. And if any of them rate each other badly, it won't send that person ever to pick you up again. So it's so smart. Lyft is the same idea. You'll be seeing these cars with fuzzy mustaches. That's a perfectly logical logo. Um, that's that's what I'm But this idea is moving all over. Parking Panda is you rent out your driveway. So if I'm, if I'm going on a trip, why should I pay $40 a night to keep my car at LaGuardia? 
Instead, I'll park at some guy's house in his garage a block away for $8 a day. Um, rent toys, you rent out stuff. You know, my power drill, my lawnmower, my leaf blower, my snow blower for the weekend. Why should I buy another one when my neighbor has one and he's willing to rent it to me for 10 bucks? Um, dog vacay, instead of putting your dog in a kennel, you let an ordinary person who wants a dog for a while to keep it in her apartment and take care of the dog. And you pay for them to shelter the dog. Such an amazing idea. So this is very disruptive. And there's, there's the same thing for bicycles. There's the same thing for musical instruments. It's, it's really catching on. So people, it's very disruptive. Uh, the taxi drivers in particular are not crazy about it. There are protests. There are tire slashings. They don't like Uber at all. But you know what? It's coming. It's now in Fairfield County, and uh, it's, I'll never take a cab around here again. I can tell you that much. It takes me like four showers to get um, You hear about this a lot. You hear about wearable tech. Uh, this is Google Glass. This is, um, you know, it's not glasses. You don't look through lenses. Instead, it puts a tiny little lens up over your eyebrow, and people say, you know, oh, that's terrible. That, that's you know, people are going to be now really distracted when they drive. And I'm like, no, I think you're going to be less distracted because, you know, ordinarily if you want to check your text, what do you do? You do this. Uh, password, you know, scroll messages, you know. And now, you never take your hands, your eyes off the wheel, you just glance up like this and see it. So, uh, at the same time, I think Google Glass is going to fail. Just like my video. Um, because um, they, they've done a great job of the technology part but they're completely ignoring the social aspect. Um, when you are talking to someone wearing Google Glass, uh, there is someone who paid $1,500 uh, for these things, and they could be recording you, videoing you, taking a picture of you, and you don't know it. It's the first time in human history there is no way to know if you're on camera. Like, even with a phone, you know, the person's doing this. Obviously, they're not talking on a phone call, right? This is, this is them filming. But with Google Glass, there's no little red lights. There's nothing to let you know. I was talking to somebody at a conference wearing them, and I'm just like, would you take those freaking things off? You're driving me crazy. You know, it's just, it's obnoxious. Um, and also, you look like a goofy cyborg. It's ridiculous. Already, there's a, there's a word that they're using to, to describe owners of these things. Oh. <laughs> um, so they are banned uh, in movies, banned at shows, banned in church, banned in restaurants, banned, God knows, in locker rooms. Um, where are you going to be able to use these things? Okay, you'll use them on your extreme biking rides, and that's it. So I think uh, from a social point of view, they're going to they're going to flop. They'll probably find um, some niche uses, you know, like aircraft maintenance and surgery and things like that, where augmented reality can show the doctor a picture of what the liver is supposed to be looking like or whatever it like, operates. But um, it'll, it'll be like, you know how the Segway scooter was supposed to change the world? And now it's like used for mall cops and that's it. You know? So um, I think it'll be, be like that. Um, a lot of people are talking about uh, the smartwatches these days. That's the Samsung Galaxy Gear, the first big name smartwatch. It's like wearing a VCR on your arm. I mean, it is so big and so heavy. This thing allows you, incredibly, to make phone calls up to your wrist like this. Like, that's what the world's waiting for? Like, you thought it was bad when Bluetooth headsets came out and guys would walk down the streets of Manhattan going, no, no, send the fax ASAP, no can do, 40% down. You know, it's like, either homeless or an executive, one of the two. Um, well, now it's going to be even worse, you know. Honey, I'm going to be a little bit late. What? I can't, I can't quite, what are you saying? Honey? You know. Like, and it has a camera built in, which is all the world needs, you know, Subway. You know, like, um, so nobody bought these either. Um, there is a wireless, I'm, I'm a wearable watch technology that I think is a big hit and will continue to be. Um, and these are the fitness bands. I'm actually reviewing two of them. Right, yeah, I'm making fun of other nerds. Um, um, I'm actually reviewing these for my column next week. 
Um, and these track your fitness and your sleep, which is so cool. And then you see them on your phone in the morning, how you did. Um, and, the, and the sleep in particular, you guys don't know anything about your sleep. You know, you wake up, you feel horrible, but you don't know why. How many times did you wake up? How lightly did you sleep? How, much, how many hours of REM sleep did you get? You guys don't know. It's a black hole in your lives. These things show you. You're like, no wonder I feel like hell. I woke up seven times. You know? um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. My wife says, well, well so what? I could have told you that. <laughs> I feel like hell. Oh, you must have woken up a lot. Done. Um, but, but the other cool thing is they tap into other people who are wearing these too. So you see, so I see how my wife, how many steps she walked yesterday, and, and it's, it's kind of like fitness through humiliation. <laughs> like, I can do better than that. Um, and uh, the, so the, the, the Fitbit and the Up Band and the Nike Fuel, um, those are all popular ones. This is a new one from Garmin here. Uh, no one even knows about this yet. What's cool about this one is it lasts a year on one battery charge. A year! And it is completely waterproof, so swimming, shower, you never have to take it off. Uh, it, it has its own problems. One of, one of them is this, this display. It's, it's like e-ink. It's like the Amazon Kindle, so you, you have to have light to see it. Which You have to tell these things when you're going to bed. So when the light's off, you have no way to see what the screen is saying. Anyway, and then this one is brand new, too. This is the Samsung Gear Fit. You actually scroll it like this. It's a touch screen. And, um, it has all these apps. It has a heart monitor. Um, let's see what my heart rate is. I haven't got time for this. Okay. <laughs> um, it too has problems, uh, but I think that's going to be the next big thing. They say that Apple is working on a smartwatch with fitness. Um, that one might be the one. Um, that's just an artist rendition, but. Uh, it, and it may be. Why are we only thinking about glasses and wrists? I mean, do you guys see the movie Her? Really good movie. Uh, but in that one, the wearable technology that everybody has is the earpiece. So it does speech recognition, and it goes to the internet, and it tells you the answers. So that's the least distracting available thing. I, you know, or maybe all of them. I, I hear a lot of people say, uh, oh, e-books are going to kill printed books. Or uh, Android is going to kill the iPhone. And you know what? That's not how things work in technology. Things don't replace things. Things just add on. They splinter. So, like, the TV was supposed to kill off the radio when it came out in the 40s and 50s. It didn't. It just added on. Uh, the, the VCR and the DVD were supposed to kill movie theaters. Who on earth would go to a movie theater when they could just watch the movie at home? That's not what happened. The opposite happened. Now, we became a nation of movie buffs. We love watching movies in both places. And... Uh, instant coffee was supposed to kill brewed coffee because who'd take the time? That isn't what happened. <coughs> Starbucks. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it used to be 15 years ago that all you had to, to follow to be on top of things was like books, TV, radio, newspapers, and were done. But then came the web, and then came wikis, and RSS feeds, and blogs, and I don't know what those things are on the bottom either. I made them up. But just give it time. <laughs> <laughs> Things just keep screwing. Um, another thing that's happening big time is robots. Since I was a kid, everybody thought of a robot as a two-legged walking thing like C-3PO, and robots never were that. And the reason they never were is because making a robot balance on two feet is incredibly hard. Harder than any engineering problem you can think of. We, humans, have all these systems to help us balance. We've got the inner ear, we've got the soles of our feet measuring pressure, we've got our eyes, um, all these different systems to help us balance. We'd have to duplicate all of that in a robot. Robots don't walk, okay? They can roll until now. So this next thing I'm going to show you is a real robot. It's from the Nova show that I hosted. This is Alpha Dog. Meet LS3, also known as Alpha Dog. It's designed specifically for rough terrain, anywhere a soldier might go on foot. And it carries 400 pounds of gear, along with enough fuel for a 20-mile mission. So Dave, in this mode, the robot's following uh, the leader. He's got a backpack on that has some reflective stripes on it. 
and the vision system focuses on that. Lots of cool tech on LS3, but my favorite feature, voice control. Power on, engine off, sit, get up, and get me a beer. That's a good one. <laughs> LS3, get up. The power! LS3, follow tight. What a good boy! <laughs> introduced Petman, a robot that balanced itself, walked, and even did some calisthenics. Over the last few years, Petman has evolved into Atlas, which has even more mobility. Just like LS3, it actively balances itself all the time. And in this impressive demo, all by itself, it uses its arms to work its way past a hole in the floor. So we are there. We are at two-legged, self-balancing robots. You've also heard a lot about drones this year. Drones, you know, we're not talking about the ones that kill people in other countries. I'm talking about consumer drones, like this one with the camera. Um, these are really revolutionizing a lot of fields. They're doing inspection of, of skyscrapers and bridges without so much risk. Um, Amazon recently introduced <laughs> this idea. They're going to deliver packages by drone in an hour. So this is their promotional video here. Hit Prime Air, 30 minute delivery. The robot, this is on 60 minutes, it was caused a big fuss. And then it flies it to your house. <laughs> yep, yeah, here's my package, half an hour later. Like, you know what, I'm not, I'm not completely convinced. You know, this is, this is America. People are going to be like, oh, a Samsung TV! <laughs> <laughs> Shoot it out of the air. Um, there's so many, so many problems with this idea, you know, regulatory and, and, you know, aircraft and stuff like that. So Netflix, a couple weeks later, just internally, we're not supposed to have seen this, came out with their own parody video of the same thing. It's cracks me up. Here at Netflix, we're committed to cutting-edge advancements and entertainment. Now we're getting back to our creative roots with our groundbreaking same-day home delivery subscription service, Drone to Home. <laughs> That's right, our fleet of high-tech drones will deliver your disc to you within mere seconds of you adding it to your queue. <laughs> okay, that was Unlike other companies trying to rush unfreezing <laughs> We have literally spent days working out most of the bugs. <laughs> services on your smartphone, that this can come right to you wherever you want to <laughs> even, even cars, this is Google's self-driving car, as you may know, they have about 30 of these. They've driven like 750,000 miles without a single accident, self-driving. And a lot of people react like, oh, I don't want to share my road with some computer. You know what? I don't want to share my road with you. <laughs> people are the worst drivers. And these guys don't make, don't make a mistake. Uh, oh, here's the kindergartner test. Stopped in time. I mean, already we have cars that parallel park automatically, and you can buy these today. Cars that stay in their lane, cars that will not rear-end somebody, no matter how little attention you're paying. Um, so I think, you know, 15 years, I think we're there. I, I personally can't wait. Um, the, just 1.3 million crashes a year come from people driving distracted. So, brother, if I can take, <laughs> take that job of driving and put it into the car, I'm all for it. Um, one thing that's really interesting is uh, all these tests of driving distracted, yes, we know that if you are texting while driving, you are uh, 20 times 
more likely to be in an accident. You're in the same degree of likeliness to die in an accident as you are if you're drunk. So, but nobody ever tested what if you're using Siri? What if you're not taking your eyes off the road? If you're texting by listening to the message said to you and dictating the responses. So finally, 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 somebody, uh, University of Texas, did a test of people texting by voice. And I just did a Scientific American column on this topic. Guess what the results were? No change. Doesn't matter if you're looking at the phone or not. It is the occupation of your brain that causes the accident. Um, this year, we've had a new privacy conversation. For, for some years now, there's been uh, a difference between the attitude toward personal privacy between younger people and their parents. In general, younger people are totally fine with giving up their personal data as long as they get something in return and as long as it's aggregate and anonymous. In other words, we're not tracking David Pogue. We're tracking you know, user 5032-1076 and collating his data with thousands or millions of other people's. You know how on Google Maps, the, the roads are color coded to show you the speed of the traffic. You ever wonder how they do that? They do that by tracking the millions of Android phones driving around in cars right now. So it knows their speed and position, so it collects all that data, crunches the numbers, and boom, it knows how fast the traffic is going. And even if you know that, young people today are like, oh, that's cool, that's a good trade off. You can track me anonymously and give me useful information. Gmail works the same way. You know, there's ads on the right side that pertain to the subject of your email. So if you say, I'm going to Mexico for vacation, you'll see ads for Mexico hotels. And older people are like, ah, that's an invasion by privacy. And younger people are like, oh, you're giving me 200 times the storage of Hotmail in exchange? Great, sign me up. Um, the fitness data, these fitness bands I mentioned before, they are now starting to collect the data from all these millions of people wearing these bands and provide interesting medical observations about it. Like, did you know that if you have a smartphone in your bedroom, you will sleep 23% worse? They don't know if it's because of the light or because your mind is racing, but it's a problem. And, and they figured this out by tra tracking the fitness data from these bands. So that's the way the conversation was for a while. What's really cool now is that we've entered a new era because of the NSA thing. The NSA, turns out, is not collecting data anonymously and in the aggregate. They are tracking you. They know uh, what phone calls you are making, they are reading your emails, and knowing what porn sites you go to. So that is a very different conversation, and even the younger people are uncomfortable with that. And a lot of people say, oh, this is a, this is a big black, black eye for America and stuff. You know what? I'm not sure, because what it did was it, it opened up this new conversation about the difference between anonymous collection and, and personal collection of data. Um, and now Yahoo and Google and Apple and Facebook, they have all made their privacy, their privacy policies transparent and published them, and they've all uh, encrypted the transmission of their information from your computer to their servers. So the, the fallout from that event was really quite positive. Um, but things are changing. Things are changing badly. Uh, I mean, quickly. Um, the, um, I was talking to a Microsoft hiring guy recently. He told me that when young people graduate from college and apply for jobs at Microsoft, they frequently leave two fields blank on the application form. The home phone number, of course, because who has a home phone anymore? and the email address. They don't do email, young people. They, they, that's fading, a fading technology. In fact, another guy told me that at his company, when they have new college hires come into the company, the orientation process includes a lesson in how to use a desk phone. <laughs> These kids have never seen a phone with a wire on it. I have. Well, <laughs> You are hired. <laughs> but it's true, if you, if you Google teen on the phone, you will find hundreds of thousands of pictures. Not a single phone has a wire on it. The era is over. It's a different change. So anyway, so the bottom line is things are changing quickly. Some things are on the way out. Anything with disks, anything with wires, 
landline phones, people watching TV on TV sets. Now they watch them on other kinds of screens. Anything on print, machines that are, are fixed and don't move. One-way communications from Walmart to the masses. Now we're, we're dealing with each other. Store and forward mechanisms like, like email. Our grandkids are going to think it's hilarious that when we used to want to rent a movie, we used to get in a car and drive to a building and borrow a disc and bring it home. They're like, what? Were you like black and white and jerky too? Like, like it's ridiculous. And on the way in are everything that is streaming and on demand and wireless and real time things that are portable and wearable, two way interaction, person to person, format splittering. Um, the, the, it's a lot going on. A lot of the times I hear from my readers, how am I possibly supposed to keep up? You know, I just bought this phone, it's obsolete, you know, three months later. Um, and I have to say, I agree too. Um, it's, it's a challenge for me even to keep up. But I learned something profound this year. Every year I go to CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. It's, this, it's the biggest trade show in North America. It's 3,200 electronics companies hawking the latest stuff. And every year, most of it is ridiculous. You know, we're going to watch, uh, we're going to watch internet on our TV. We're going to surf the web on the TV. Every year they try to get us to do this. Nobody wants it. Um, we're going to wear 3D glasses to watch our TV. Yeah, that caught on big. How many times have you worn 3D glasses in the last month? Yeah, me neither. Um, okay, you're a nerd, Jeff. Um, this year, it's all about curved TVs. Curved TVs? Like somebody's asking for this? Yes, their argument is that by curving the TV, it's more immersive. It's more around you. Well, guess what? If you curve the TV enough that you're actually inside it, the people next to you on the couch can't see anything but the back. So, as a result, they just curve it a tiny bit, not enough to make any difference. It looks ridiculous on the wall. Um, I know why they sell these things. It's, it's for people who have no other furniture to lean on. <laughs> They're going to be a total flop. I'm like, why? Why did they waste so many millions trying to pawn off on a stuff that obviously nobody wants? Why? And this year, I had an epiphany. I realized why. And it goes back to my roots. I used to conduct Broadway shows. For 10 years, I worked on musicals. And 8 out of 10 of them flopped. I mean, over and over and over, and still eight out of ten of them fly. And at the same time, I was paying house calls to celebrities to teach them how to use their computers. And one of them was this guy, William Goldman. He's the author of uh, The Princess Bride, <laughs> theme for today's Maker Faire, Princess Bride. He wrote The Princess Bride and Marathon Man, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, and he wrote this... What? Oh, that's a different, that's a different Goldman, yeah. I think it's his brother, actually. Yeah, but William Goldman wrote these. And I thought, how cool to go to his house and teach him his computer. And there on his bookshelf were those books right next to these books. The Moving Target, The Color of Light, Heat, Brothers, The Silent Gondoliers, Control, Boys and Girls Together. What? What are these? But your turn to curtsy, my dude, what are those books? You're William Goldman. He goes, oh, those are my flops. It turns out, when he's writing a book, he has no idea if it's going to be a hit or a flop. <laughs> he doesn't know, he writes them all the same way. Excuse me, I, I get a little bitter. Um, <coughs> and so, those happen to be the ones that became famous. But at the time he's writing, he doesn't know. So all you can do is keep inventing and see which ones become something, which ones become a thing. <coughs> you can't know, and I realize it's the same thing with books, it's the same thing with movies, same thing with Broadway shows, and it's the same thing with electronics. That's why they keep throwing so much junk at us. 80% of it's going to be junk, but 20% of it will catch on and become the iPad, or the up band, or the next big hit. So, I'm a little more forgiving now. Now I understand that you have to keep trying, even with that 80% failure ratio, or you'll never move forward. So. I cannot predict what the future technology will be. What I can predict is it is going to be a wild ride. Thank you so much.
We now for a, a brief moment of music. So I do this um, I do this funny thing where I write new words to old lyrics, I mean new to old songs about the technology industry. And um, and I usually come here to the library and, and do one on the piano after my talk. Would you like to hear one? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, this is the newest one. This is uh, the Twitter song to the tune of I Feel Free. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. There I glitter. I'm witty, witty and rare. I'm not bitter that the only friends I have are there. Twitter caters to 10th graders and to haters and the unemployed. But nothing's greater than an evening spent inside the void. What's that little number I'm seeing there? What could that impressive count be? 121, 122, 123 followers of me. One's a butcher, one's a plaga, Ashton Kutcher and Gaga for real. I'm so cool, I know everything they think and feel. postings this way, to know that the world pays attention to the tiniest drum drum details of my day. Uh, when I go eat lunch, let's say Taco Bell, I tweet what I eat with pictures as well. Oh, follow me please, how can I express how the brilliance I squeeze in ten words or less? You can just leave out every vowel. Someday I'll find love, she's in for a treat. You know what I'll do, propose in a tweet. Too much tweetings, self-defeating. They are treating me for OCD. They say meeting some real people might be good for me. Quitter. Mindless frittering isn't a crime. 